Hi there, folks. Hello. Hi, are you? Hi, are you? It's a Friday evening. It's half six. And what do we do around Friday evenings on a half six is last while? We tune in and we try to get some information which is worthwhile talking about. And we try to get people on the show who are worthwhile listening to and worthwhile having as guests. Tonight, I have I have actually had a situation tonight where obviously I've just been, I haven't been let down, but obviously our own champion, Eamon Lochran. Uh, tonight has just pulled out because of a family situation and we're certainly hoping that everything's going to be okay there and some things are a lot more important than others so there's not an issue there we, we, we'll get him in again to talk but obviously tonight uh tonight's show is a look back and it's, it's almost a, a memorial show uh to one of the greatest middleweights if not the greatest middleweight boxers of all time tonight we're going to have a wee chat uh with a gentleman from belfast a man who has knowledge of boxing I have never, ever met. It's absolutely the cream of everything I have ever wished to have a coffee with someone who can talk so much about a subject and have it mastered so much with, as far as his historical understanding of it's concerned, is the Irish Burt Sugar. It's Mr. Eamon McCauley all the way from Belfast. Eamon McCauley, welcome on, and how are you again, sir? It's great to meet you. I'm, I'm good, Sean. I'm keeping great, and I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely brilliant. I'm going to talk about one of my favourite fighters, Marvin Hagler. Marvellous Marvin Hagler. I knew the minute, if God will forgive me for saying this here, I knew the minute Marvin Hagler passed away, one of the first people I contacted was you. And I says, if there's a man tonight that's going to have the heart tore out him and he's going to be disappointed, I says it's going to be Eamon McCauley. And me and Eamon Lawford said the same. Eamon, I take it that whenever you, did you, did you fall into shock whenever Eamon, uh, Eamon whenever you heard that uh, Hagler had died? I did. I did indeed. It was very, very... No, it was quite a shock. It was numb. Yeah. I still haven't came to terms with it. It's, uh, it's just very, very hard to believe. And it's a great loss to the boxing family. <clears throat> you know, for a man he, who... He, he was very unique. Ah, you know, look, I, I, I think, I, I think, Eamon, just before we go into, and we, go, we go into the guts of his career here, I have a couple of pictures and I have a video and not, not, you know, to show. I, I do not think we will ever, ever see his likes again. Well... I started boxing in 1979, and that was the year he challenged Vito Antifermo for the world middleweight title. And he won clearly, but they called it a draw. But uh, yes, all through my boxing career, uh, Marvin Hagler, from 1980 to 1987, he was world middleweight champion. And he was one of the first ambidextrous boxers, if not the first that I ever seen. Yeah, I, yeah, I, very I much so. They're all switch hitters today. He was the first one I ever seen. He could box just as good orthodox as he could so far. I have a couple of quotes. I sorry, I have a couple of quotes here. Going ahead there. What were you going to say there? Mean, moody, and magnificent. The three M's, huh? After marvelous Marvin Hagler, huh? I have a number of quotes here from people in the boxing professionalism, journalism uh, side of the sport, and obviously people who were in and around the same era who trained and fought. And obviously admired uh, the man we're talking about tonight, who is marvelous Marvin Hagler. And might I just obviously just before we go much further in the show here this evening, might I just remind everybody that uh, I have a couple of sponsors of my shows here. These people pay for the airtime. And first of all, I want to say thanks very much to Mr. Ali Gordon, who of Ali G Decorating Services, uh, the interior designer of, of experts, stays on www.aligdecorating.co.uk, who can be got on o double seven six two three four zero. 920 and also the great big al's barbecue smokehouse the best meat that you will ever taste and the uh, look there's absolutely no doubt about it nothing comes close to big al's big al's uh pizza and smokehouse on by uh, brasilian street palomina these guys pay for the airtime that we're talking on him and so i just obviously like to to put out a wee, a wee word for them you know i hope you understand so basically, the situation is, you know, I'm going to go right from the start of uh, Marvin Mar Marvin Hagler's career. He was born in New York, now not New York, but New York in, in, in uh, New Jersey, in America, on May the 23rd, 1954. He then moved to Brockton, Massachusetts. And this was after race riots. Now, race is going to come into this here, because Joe, you're aware of what Joe Frazier says to him, are you? I am indeed. Three Tell me, against him. the three strikes against him. What were the three strikes yeah. against him? He was black, he was a southpaw, and he was damn good. He was damn good, was right. So they didn't like that, obviously. So he went in, he started boxing in 1969. He was bullied as a kid after race riots and stuff. You know, he was pushed around by police, you know. So his family were, were very Christian. 
So they moved him and the family and whatnot, and the half-brother, Robbie Sims, actually, they moved him to Brockton, Massachusetts in 1969, where he ran into Pat and Guri Pertinelli, Italianos from New York. And obviously he went training there, and uh, they knew right away that the first time he sparred, he got caught. Right. But of course... What did Marvin do? He, he burst himself down and straight back in again the next day, you know what I mean? So therefore they knew that they were dealing with somebody who had a bit of stink in him. You know, when you say stink in boxing, you're talking about that type of, you know, you're not going to hurt, uh, you know what I mean? Okay. As well as you're aware. You were aware that he won the National Golden Gloves. He was twice AAU champion. Yeah, that's right. And then he went on to win the year. I think his mother and father separated very early in his life. They did, they did, they did. So he had a sort of upbringing there where he had an upbringing there where there was heartache. Yeah. You know, so he had to fight his way to, to, to get his dream. Yes. As you would say, you know, I mean, as I, I suppose we all know what that means, Eamon. You know, we've all had to fight out of our own areas to try and, you know, us working class people, we've all had to try and fight to, to get further in life and, you know, to use yeah, something well, to... Everything, everything came very hard to Marvin Hagler. Nothing came easy. You know, he took the hard route. And, you know, he was avoided. Uh, he wasn't given a title shot, even though he deserved one. I'm going to come on to that. I'm going to come on to that. I'm going to risk too far ahead, yeah. Uh, I'm going to, no, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm actually at that area now. Because he then turned professional with Pat and Goody uh, Petronelli. And he had something like 43 knockouts in 50 fights. And you talk about race. And you're saying there that you know about what Joe Fraser system. That's a disgrace. Surely there could have been. Would that not be a lawsuit? Well, he, he 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 went to Philadelphia and he boxed the best boxers. The toughest middleweights were in Philadelphia, and he boxed them all. And uh, he had his first defeat there against Bobby Boogaloo Watts, and it was a That's day right. late robbery. Uh, it was Aye. a day late robbery. I mean, a robbery of robberies. Yeah. And it booed the decision long and hard, and then he came back. A couple of months later, and Willie Lavorne Monroe beat him, and Willie Lavorne Monroe did beat him, which Hagler acknowledged. And Hagler told Willie Monroe, "You give me a lesson there." But subsequently, Hagler knocked out Willie Lavorne Monroe twice after that. He boxed Cyclone Hart, who was a great middleweight from Philadelphia, a big puncher. Danny That's Fusco. right. I mean, That's he, right. he, he didn't avoid anybody. Took them all on and beat he everyone. Took them all on the best middleweights, beat the best yeah. middleweights, but still couldn't get a title shot. shot. Never got a title shot, was avoided. And Vito Antifermo, he got it, he he won the title. And uh fair play to Vito Antifermo, he gave he gave yeah. Hagler a shot. But Hagler won the fight clearly and the judge in the, Las Vegas. No doubt about it. A draw. Lot of blood spell too. So instead of Antifermo having a rematch for Hagler, he fought Alan Minter. And you, then you Minter took, beat Antifermo. He took the words out of my mouth. When Minter wanted then he give Antifermo a rematch. So this was all adding to Marvin's Moodiness is meanness. That's right. Is bitterness. And what was it that Alan Minter said that night in the Albert Hall the day on the, whenever they were weighing in? He wouldn't lose to a black guy, and that's why he didn't get his OB. He got a mercy on Alan Minter, a great, great boxer. I agree. I loved Alan Minter. I thought Alan Minter was a nice guy, but that was stink, and I hate racism, and I hate all that type of hatred. So you know, uncharacteristic I of Alan Minter. It was. It was uncharacteristic. I think maybe it was trying to just push things up a bit, put bombs and seats or something, and promote it or something. No. Well, boy, did Hagler make him pay for it. Oh, my goodness. Like, in the first round, he came out like with cleavers in his hands. And the second round, he may have come out with, with mints in his hands. And the third round, even that, 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 that picture sticks with me forever. It shows you that Hagler's, if you look at it here, I don't have the video of it, but if you look at it here, you can see uh, Hagler standing on the ropes, and he lets two go. And the gum shield just flies out all over the place. And then the eye just splits wide open, and you see him holding on to his eye like that there. And that was just good night, Irene. You know, like I don't think there was ever, I don't think any British boxer was ever sliced like that, just like a can of beans, you know. Oh, he was cut the ribbons. He was cut. The oh, ribbons. he was cut. <laughs> Hagler, Hagler was a very sharp cutting puncher. Not Aye. only did he cut Alamenter to pieces, he cut Vito Antifermo to pieces. I didn't. He cut, he cut Tony Simpson to pieces. I and I loved Sim Simpson, was my favorite out of them all. Yeah, well, he took Tony Simpson apart in six rounds. Uh, he didn't, did. Massachusetts. Sorry, it was Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, it wasn't in Worcester, Massachusetts. You're right, so I'm watching it. 
So that, that that's him there. That's him there, Eamon, against uh, Fito on the Fermo there. That, that's the first fight in 1879. Yeah, as indeed. And then you're, you you were talking about Minter, obviously, there in Hangar. That was uh, Saturday, September 27th, 1980. I mean, watching it in our house. There's we Colin Jones was fighting that night as well. And coincidentally, you had Tony Simpson, Simpson. and yeah. Dave Green was on the Dave Boy Green was on the set. They all fought for world titles and all unsuccessful. Right, right. You know, so Can I tell you something—a wee story about Marvin Hagler. Of course, no that's what we're here for. Hit me with There's it. There's no better man to speak to about Marvin Hagler than Jim Montague, who lives in Antrim Town. Jim Montague, origi yeah. Origi originally from the Lamestone Road in North Belfast. Jim, who you know, went to the 1972 Munich Olympics. Yeah. And then in that same year, 1972, he met his hero, Muhammad Ali. And then when he was over in America boxing, Elvis Presley came into the dressing room to wish him all well. This is a wee kid from North Belfast. And that's the opportunities boxing can give you. But in, in the late 70s, Jim Montague went over to Brockton, Massachusetts and boxed Tony Patronelli, who was the younger brother of Goody and Pat Patronelli. Yeah, that's and right. Into the fight, got into the fight, Tony Patronelli was uh, something like 27 wins and one defeat. His one defeat was when he boxed for the world late while they were title against Wilfredo Benitez and he lost a points decision. So what did Jim do? Jim went over and knocked him out in Brockton, Massachusetts. And then they, told, they said to Jim, they begged Jim when he came back for a rematch. And he says, Jim, bring your wife, bring your family, have a good time, but don't try too hard. Now, I've interviewed Jim, it's on YouTube. Don't take my word for it. I'm only quoting from Jim. Jim says to Cap saying, they, they give him a great time, but the Cap saying to him, Jim, now don't try too hard. That night at the fights, Marvin Hagler was the bodyguard for Jim Montague's wife and looked after her, beside her during the, all the fights that night. And Jim got to know Marvin Hagler pretty well. So you must get him on. If you want me to facilitate it, I will. Get Jim Montague on one night and talk to him about Marvin Hagler. Uh, actually, that, that would be great. That, 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 that sounds very exciting. Jim Montague. Uh, I always thought it was Jim Montague. Uh, you know, well, it it's sort of. Uh, it was actually in the Irish News a couple of weeks ago about that. There shortly after, it was actually in the Irish News. There was a page. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't. Know I that. wasn't did. Yeah, I think their boxer sets on Tuesday. Right. Yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah, I've seen you. I've seen your interviews. Yeah, there's no yeah. doubt about it. He was around uh, with Larmer and them boys, wasn't he? That's well. Yes, he went to the '72 Olympics. Larmer went to the '76 Olympics. Yeah. I've seen all them interviews on your page, obviously. That's what I say. And that was one of my main inspirations, even at the time, to start doing like broadcasts and stuff like that. There, you know, I've told you that before. Uh, obviously, I'm going to move on then, Eamon. You're aware of uh, who's this guy here? Uh, let me see. He fought him twice. Mustafa Hamshul. I've got my glasses with me. That's uh, Mustafa Hamshul. He also Mustafa fought Mustafa Hamshul to pieces. He did indeed. He sliced he him up the... that. That was unbelievable. Him. You know, uh -huh. and he you know, like, originally from Syria, had to move uh, to New York, uh, jump ship, and uh, he had a very hard life, tough uh, guy, number one contender, had beat Minter in an eliminator, but no match for Hagler, no match at all. 11 yeah. rounds, Hagler butchered him. You know, even Locker Novak says to me, he says, uh, you know, it's one of these things that sticks with me, and I think I've actually said it to you before as well, you know, and you've come out with something similar as well, you know, that. Eamon, there's one thing about boxing. You'll never see somebody that's, that comes from a real well-off background fight hard. Uh, well, right, right. You know, yeah. you, I think you hate yeah, hungry. The you, you have to be the hunger, isn't there? You have to have been stuck for your meat at night time to be turning around saying to yourself, look, I better go out here and get these knuckles on. You know what I mean? You know, you look at Duran, you look at uh, any of them boys there that's fought in the past. Them boys is all coming out of slums. You know, these guys is coming out of areas where there's mat. We think we, we we think we try to understand poverty. We have VGs and stuff. They don't have maces and VGs. And, do you know, like you were in Panama, weren't you? You were yes. in Panama and, and you sparred in a gym where there was water coming through the the, the, the tin hut or something, was it? That, there was holes in the roof. You know, the, the but rain they, was coming through. Yeah. But these guys all had the the, the, the eye of the tiger. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, I, I find all that amazing. I find all that pretty romantic. That's true. You can make so much of it making films about things like that. Well, well, boxing's a great uh, escape, a great working class escape sport. You can go from poverty to plenty. Yeah. 
But I, I met I met Marvin Hagler in nineteen ninety one. I was to be on the I was on the undercard. He, he boxed his half brother Robbie Sims. Robbie at Sims, yeah. At the York Hall Bethnal Green, and at the way in, I took the opportunity to go over and speak to Hagler, but I picked the wrong time. His brother was just weighing in, and I started talking to him. Marvin, you're the greatest, blah blah blah. And he turned round to me and he gave me a look that he gave Alan Minter and Tommy Hearns, and he just said, "I'm busy, man." And I went, oh, no problem, Marvin. Some other time. And I beat a hasty retreat. Huh? Unbelievable. You know, it just it just seemed to have that thing. You know. Now here's a here's a picture of him and a guy there. Now you see Tony Simpson. I yeah. followed Tony Simpson right through the whole of his career because at that age, obviously, Simpson had every right to begin in with uh, Hagler at that stage. That was 1983. Simpson had every right to win with Hagler, and Hagler even he won, says he won a final eliminator against Dwight Davison. Yeah, he did indeed. He had knocked Alan Minter out in two rounds. Steve. He did indeed, and they had the Don Lee and all them boys. He'd been in with all them guys. That was, after, that was after the Hagler fight. You know, he had stood with all them guys, and I, I love Tony Simpson. And one thing about Tony Simpson is that he got very, very close with Marvin Hagler. That's right. So he did. He was actually in the newspaper yesterday. It was on the internet as well. There, uh, I, I actually should have clipped it and brought it. Uh, he says uh, he couldn't believe that whenever he, he, he heard that Hagler had died, he says that if, there's, if there was a chance that I could bring him back, he says he would do anything to bring him back. He says he's just a great guy because he invited him over to his house and all, you know, they stayed there and right. stuff like that. You know what I mean? You're saying there. Well, every time Marvin Hagler is in Britain, he rings Tony Simpson to come and meet him. Ah, uh, you know, and things like that. Shows. You know, there's that great, there's that great everlasting relationship, you know, uh -huh. out of two guys beating the lungs out of each other. Now, here's, here's the, a, a, we then go on to uh, a 12-round points decision. We Jaran, huh? 15-round 15, 15 points decision. Aye, uh, 15, uh, 15, you're right. In fact, that, that was actually, in fact, did that not go down in history as the last 15-round fight? 1983. Uh, well, 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 Dave Boy McCauley and Fidel Bass, that was 1987. That was a 15-round fight. Aye, uh, so I uh, right enough, yeah. That was four years later. Like, as, as I say, folks, this man's range of knowledge on the history of boxing is second to none. You know, I'm I'm good, I'm sharp, but I'm not I'm not razor lance as far as uh, Mr. McCauley is concerned here. You know, Eamon, stop making me look bad. <laughs> Marvin Hagler's reign, you know, he made twelve title defenses, Aye. and uh, yep, Jerome was the only one to take him a distance. The That's rest right. Of him, he, he absolutely destroyed. He, well, you know, should have Leonard. He went the distance with Leonard. Well, yeah, no. Uh, Yes, but as as winning title defenses. I I sorry sorry defenses, sorry of course sorry. That he, he he went to distance with and that was Roberto Duran. And if you look getting, at that picture, getting, getting back getting back to the Sugar Ray Leonard fight, they, they call that controversial. I have to be honest now. Wear my heart heart in my sleeve. I'm massive massive big Marvin Hagler fan, and I didn't really like Sugar Ray Leonard because I thought he was a bit cocky, a bit arrogant. I, I thought he was I, that. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't know at that time that Sugar Ray Leonard was an alcoholic. And Neither did I. The, well, well, that's a fact. That's a fact. And he said that he would mess up. Well, well, I'm not allowed to use bad language here, but he said he would f up Hagler's life when when he beats him. And in my opinion, he did beat him. Now I wanted Hagler to win, but Hagler lost, and Hagler lost quite clearly. From the fifth round to the twelfth round. Well, I, I, you see, I'm, I'm going to, but he I'm lost going to the take, first four rounds. I'm going to take really? quotes. I'm going to take quotes from experts, and there's one quote stands out of mind from the man that I would trust in journalism with my life, as you say, right? It's a man called Hugh McAvaney. Hugh McAvaney has seen them all. Hugh, Hugh's dead now. God rest him. The greatest sports journalist for me that ever lived. Uh, he's seen them all, and he says. That if the judges were able to have clearly seen how many times that Sugar Ray Leonard's bombardments hot Marvin Hagler on the shoulders and on the arms and in the gloves, the score might have been different. And I'm entitled to believe the same. You know, I'm yeah. entitled to believe. I'm entitled to believe that because I think that's what I seen. But then I wasn't from ringside, so I wasn't. You know, from the fifth round to the twelfth round, you couldn't have split them. But Leonard yeah. clearly won the first four rounds. I argues about that. Hagler boxed the wrong fight. His tactics were wrong. He came out and boxed Orthodox the first four rounds when he's actually a southpaw. 
You know, he needed to do what he and Jim Watts said it in, in the commentary. He needs to do what he does best, and that's back to South Paul. He uh, lost the first four rounds, or practically give the first four rounds away. So, and after that, from the fifth to the twelfth, it was a very close fight. But to me, he lost the fight by four rounds, and it's to me, it's not controversial. I've seen robberies, I've seen bad decisions, and I wanted Hagler to win because I was a Hagler fan. But he was beat, and he was beat clearly. It was Hagler who caused all the. Well, you know the the amazing the amazing moaning about the amazing thing about it is, Eamon, that we all have opinions. And, uh, yes, yes. You know, we all we all have opinions, and we're we're all we all respect each other's opinion. That's the most important thing, of course. You know, what I mean, you know, you would say four rounds. I would say he didn't beat him. Right. You know, but that doesn't mean, and that's you that's thought, just. You thought Hagler won. I thought. Well, I don't know whether Hagler won or not, but I know it was a lot closer than a lot of people think it was. That's what I think. I think that you know, yeah. could be wrong. You know. A million people would say I'm wrong, including yourself, you know. And that's the way I've it is. Seen, that's the way I've it. seen robberies. I've seen Aye, robberies. you know what I mean. And I wanted Hagler to win. I was a big Hagler fan. But that wasn't a robbery. He lost the first four rounds, clearly. Nobody disputes that. You see, the I, always round, thought, I always thought... I couldn't have split them. I always thought even the Sugar Ray Leonard was pampered. Oh, pampered? Fighting Roberto Duran, fighting Wilfred Benitez, fighting Tommy Hearns, fighting I, but I'm, I mean from I mean from an amateur... He was pampered. Oh, he was. Oh, no. I thought he always got better conditions and better treated, more he money. Never avoided anybody. Here's something you, you know, just touched on something that's very important. Sure. He avoided. Listen. Very he avoided a man. He, listen. He avoided a man that would have been, and that's why he never you fought. Say this. Was you Aaron say Pryor? This. Aaron Pryor would have made him look stupid. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Can I say this? Can I yeah, say of this? Of course. Of course. Of course. Right. Hagler giveaway. Seeing the negotiations for the Leonard <laughs> fight. Hagler. Give away. Leonard got all his way. He got all his conditions and all the things he wanted. A, 15, a 12 round fight instead of a 15 round fight. Uh, uh, a bigger ring instead of a smaller ring. And what was the other uh, stipulation? Yes, 12 rounds instead of 15 rounds. Hagler willingly give them away to Leonard. And to me, it was a big mistake because he thought he would have knocked Leonard out. They were three conditions that he should never give away. It should have been a fifteen round. Fight. I would have to agree with you because if I won fifteen and also rounds, the size of the gloves. Leonard and Leonard insisted on bigger gloves. He got his way in too. See, why is why there not? Why disagree with me? What, what, no, no, I'm not disagreeing. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I'm not. Well, I'm disagreeing with you. Yeah, I'm disagreeing with you. There's no doubt about it. I think, but what? I'm, 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 I'm disagreeing with you on a different track. I'm talking from an amateur. You know, Aaron Pryor. Was the best amateur at his weight, but didn't get picked for the no, limits. No, 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 you're wrong again. Howard Davis Jr. was because he beat Aaron Prayer twice in Olympic box offs. So get your facts right, Sherman. Well, hang on a minute, Mister McCauley. This is this is what it's all about. This is all good. This is good viewing here, you know. And this is what makes this is what makes good viewing. As you can see, this man, this man from Belfast, is definitely as cool as ice. He's as fresh as a daisy. As far as the history of boxing is concerned, but Eamon, I still, I have always had this out with Eamon Lockern and many other boxers, young Paddy Lockern, uh, Dermot Hamill, and most of the other guys that are on the pages there. The thing for me is, at the end of the day, sometimes I don't care what other people say because I feel what, what I feel I think is right. You know what I mean? And I suppose that's what opinions all about. You know, that's not an argumental thing. Basically, the fact of the matter is, when Aaron Pryor called Sugar Ray Leonard out, Sugar Ray Leonard brought up a weight. He yes, didn't he want it. It was known. It was known that he Tommy didn't. Hearns yes, but it was known. It was known that he didn't want to fight because Hearns, Hearns had, or I think he had Hearns' number in the amateur games. He beat him three or four times. No, he beat him once. He beat him three. The season. Sorry, it wasn't a split the season, but he beat him once. He, he stopped him. Hearns once. He stopped him in the second round. No, that's, that, that's nonsense. I have the video that's here. The video is, I don't have the video here, but I have the video on YouTube. The video is on YouTube. But the thing is, for me, the thing is, for me, at the end of the day, I still think that Aaron Pryor, for me, is the best boxer around that time I've seen. Well, that's your and, opinion. That's okay. Yes. You know, and he but they never get in. None of them, none of them would get. Why would not? The question I'm asking is, and I'm not contesting against any of your knowledge, but the question I ask is, why did they not give him a shot? They dodged him. 
Well, because he was a light welterweight. They, Sugar Ray Leonard went up and fought Marvin Hagler, the fearsome Marvin Hagler at middleweight. Are you seriously suggesting that Sugar Ray Leonard was the skirt of Aaron Pryor? When, when he fought Tommy Hearns, was a, who was a monster, then he stepped up the late middleweight and beat Ayub Kalule, and then he went up the middleweight and beat Marvin Hagler. Yeah, he took a take. I'm, not, suge- I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm not suggesting that at all. But what I'm suggesting is that when he was a welterweight, Aaron Pryor, you can see this on YouTube as well, Aaron Pryor turned around and went into the actual hall where he was at and went up and called him out and just, hey, Sugar, you're sweet. He says, but listen, I'll come up seven pound and fight you. What about that one? Leonard, he says, I don't think it'll ever happen. You know, he said he's bigger fresh fry. He didn't like the way he worked. Well, 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 it, it, it may be hard. It may be hard. It may be hard. Bigger, it may be hard. Money matches. They were bigger money matches. Hans, uh, Hagler, you know, Geron, they were bigger money certain matches. Certainly, of course. Of well, you know, when you're, talk, when you're talking about Hagler and Hearns, uh, you're, talking about, you know, you're talking about the, the four kings. Can back on can back onto the track of the likes of, of the conversation we're having him and about uh, the likes of Hagler here. Being one of the the top four, being one of them four, we'll never ever see that again. You'll never see them that boys like that. A wonderful time, wonderful time in my you know, life. I, I was I was mad into boxing then. I was buying the Ring magazine, the KO magazine, Boxing Illustrated. I couldn't get enough of boxing, and it was a great era to grow up in and to be boxing in. Yes, they dominated the sport then. They they shifted the emphasis from the heavyweights to the lightweights. I, I suppose whenever I, I, I would rate, I would rate Marvin Hagler as maybe in the top three or top five greatest middleweights ever. Right? Well, I would I have, have him as the best. I would have Harry. Oh, you're a big Harry Greb fan, I. And most most of the historians, if not all historians, would tell you the same, Sherman. Okay, I'm going to get you. I have two books on on Harry Greb. I'm going to land you them. You want to read about this guy, it'll blow you away. Now, Harry Greb only made about five middleweight title defences, but he had beat all the best middleweights before they gave him a shot. He had not only beat all the best middleweights, but he'd beat all the best late heavyweights and all the best heavyweights. You need to read about this man. I would have Carlos Mons on, who made 14 title defences. Carlos Mons on to 76, yeah. I would rate him above Hagler. Sugar Ray Robinson, you know... At middleweight, Sugar Ray Robinson is the greatest boxer ever and the greatest welterweight. But at middleweight, he was getting old. He was inconsistent. He won it, he lost it, he won it, he lost it. But he would be well there too in the top five. But Hagler would be probably number three or four. Aye. Of, modern, of, of modern times, Hagler is the number one. Well, yeah, Bernard Hopkins made 20 title defences too, but not all of them were the undisputed title. So but tell me. Subjective. If you had Bernard Hopkins in his prime and Marvin Hagler in his prime over 12 rounds, who, where was your fiver going? Oh, that would be a hard one to pick because Bernard Hopkins is a very awkward fighter. Never boxed amateur. Bernard Hopkins came out of jail, turned pro. Uh, that would be a hard one to pick because of Hopkins' style. Very, very awkward, very hard to box. Very hard, impossible to look good against. Well, tell me this here. Now was Hagler... All the best middleweights. Was Hagler ever knocked down? Well, the, the one rolled on fight was a slip. Clearly, he got a count. You had, yeah, I say, you got a count. A count is right. Clearly, a slip. Clearly, <laughs> he had a granite chin, Marvin Hagler. Aye, and so did rolled on. One rolled on. He had a granite chin too. He was a hard boy. You know, he, well, he, he was, was an Argentinian. The canvas in the tenth round. He was, yep. str- you know, he was an Argentinian, and he just didn't have that class. But he was in that top at that time. He was in that top ten. No, he was yeah, in that, you know. Deservedly so. And yeah, there's no doubt about so. it. And he made he his money. He, he got in the ring with a burr and one rolled on. The burr had gloves on, you know that, don't you? <laughs> he, he, got in, he got in with a live burr. And oh, him, come on now, come, come on. on. Well, well, that's what, that's what the tell us. That's what the media what tell What was it? Was, was, was it Queen? By what? I know, I know what you mean. So apparently, apparently Gerard knocked out a horse. Yes, that's another... Oh, yes, I know, I know, I know, right there. Yeah. Well, hey... You're moving on then to uh, possibly, you know, like I have the video of the first round here, and you know, like what can you say? You talk about war, you talk about, you know, you talk about all these different things, you know, and you talk about people getting into a ring, you know, and it's just, it's just something, Eamon, that I'll always live with people. That fight, can you, can you remember much about it? Oh, I remember very, very, very well. I was boxing in the ABS. I, I set the alarm. I was boxing in the semi-finals of the ABS the next the next day, and I set the alarm to wake me up at four o'clock so as I could listen to it on the radio 
and I was living in London, and the fight was that exciting. I couldn't get back to sleep. I was so excited. <laughs> I was up to the high dough. Oh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know what the radio commentary is like? It's much worse that, than the here, TV. And that's all in eight minutes. Yeah. Imagine being at ringside for that first round. Well, you know, I think I think at the end of the day, Eamon, that has bound to been, you know, the, 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 the first, the second, and the, the half of the, of the third round until the end. For me, that has been better than a lot of 12 round fights. You know, there's no, there's been more, there was more packed into that first round, uh, which we're going to watch here. There was more packed into that first round. If you can excuse the term, there was bombs, bullets, machine gun, there was everything was brought into the ring. And they both had a match. A lot of pent up here. It was just, it was just completely. Of course, the customary before these fights. And here we go. Round one. Hagler, right off the bat. Let me begin inside. He wasn't able to clean the herd and the ropes if he can. A more aggressive start by Hagler. Look at him right through the body. Robert Hagler only wants the body. He bangs Bob. Oh, Hans Smith on him with a right. time I watch that, and I've watched that a thousand times, and I'm sitting, and I just can't get over the fact that they just didn't stop punching for the whole three minutes. Eamon, you've been in many a boxing ring, you've trained many an hour, you've fought many a three rounds, you've fought many a six rounds, many an eight rounds. Eamon, to do that there at that level, consistently for that three minutes, every point, you know, you're not jabbing and trying to just jab, you're trying to kill me each punch, that's going to be so exasperate. What would that not be like? Well, the two of them are really loading up. A lot of pent up hate there, a lot of animosity. And uh, yep, uh, the referee, Richard Steele, he was the third man in the ring. And uh, he only got a photo with Marvin Hagler and Tommy Hearns. No, together, the three of them together. He only got yeah. a photo two years ago. 
There you are. Yeah. Richard Steele were pro probably one of the greatest referees out of them all. In fact, basically, Steele, I suppose. You know, there was a lot of rumours went round, and I don't know whether you were aware. There was a lot of rumours went round that obviously the day on the day of the fight, that the minute uh, what we call it got up, the crunk man, my shirt. Yeah. The minute he got up out of his bed, things started to go wrong that day. There was people calling him, and he didn't. You know, they were saying, "Look, you know, you better watch when you go downtown." They're doing roadworks. He had to take an extra five mile around the, the city to get to Crunk. By that time, someone else was in. They were doing different things. Somebody had give Tommy a rub. Yeah, I heard, I heard all that. Too. They had given him a massage, yeah. which nullified him and made him sort of drain. Do you know what I mean? And I think you can maybe... Do you not know make excuses. Do you know we can all make excuses? Come here, man. Marvin Hagler said he was never hurt in that fight. I think he was hurt in that first round. Well, I think you can see he went off balance and, and, and he started to cover up. Uh, Hedler never covered up. Yeah, he did. He did there, but, you know. He said the only time he was ever hurt in his whole career was by Tony Simpson. That's some compliment to Tony Simpson. Uh, but I, th I think I think Hearns hurt him. I, th I looked like Hearns hurt him. But Hedler denies that. Oh, Jesus, Eamon. Excuse that language there, by the way. Uh, forgive me there. Uh if Hearns was hitting him as hard as he was hitting him, and as clean and as fresh as he was hitting him, and sliced him right through here, yes, he did indeed. Yes. yes. Now that's that's hard skin there. You would nearly hit him with a hammer to get split there, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. You know. Tommy so Hunt if he is coming off a devastating knockout of Roberto Duran, that's right. I right. thought he could knock out anybody. Aye. Hegler's chin held up that night. And didn't it? Him past. And that's what we're talking it's about. You know, exceptional chin is granite chin. Got him through that fight. He was able to take Hearns' punches, and Hearns thought he could have walked through Hagler, and that was a big mistake. Let you know, that's the last thing we have Emmanuel Stewart and all. They're just excuses. Aye. See, we can all have excuses. I make excuses for my life. Aye. We of all course do. we do. We all do, we all do don't we? Try and cover it up. You know, and that's why we're here, folks, just to reiterate the fact to everybody out there that's watching. We're here tonight to pay respect to one of the greatest boxers that ever lived, and possibly uh, as what I would think would be the greatest middleweight boxer that ever lived. Of course, Eamon has differences. Eamon's knowledge in boxing steeps right back to the early centuries. But, you know, I think in modern times we would, we would agree, Eamon, that, that Hagler was something else, obviously. And just come back into his career here then. Uh, obviously, after, after, the, the, uh, after the war... Which was with Thomas Hearns there, which we watched the, the first round there, the three rounds. He put Tommy, big Tommy just lost everything. He was just, he was dangling all over the place. They just put him out. And you'll even see Tommy was smiling when he was nearly out, knowing that that was it. He says, You got, you know, he may as well say, You bloody got me, didn't you? You know what I mean? And then they became friends. Right. And they respected each other, you know. And they went on the road for something like 60 nights all around America promoting that. That was, that was high steam. At that time, they must have just, you know, as you're saying, they went into the ring and uh, well, balls Hagler were just let off, you know. Year. Marvin Hagler was out for a year after that fight, you know, it, you know. And then he came back, uh, he boxed John Mugabe. I have it here, I have uh, a picture of John Mugabe there. He put John Mugabe out in the 11th round. Beast. And John the Beast Mugabe. And he had 26 fights and 26 KOs at the time. So he was no, he was no sucker. Yep. And he, yeah, he was no sucker. And you took the word, I'm going to talk about this fight. Eamon, I watched that fight the other night, and you'll notice that Hegler never pushed uh, Thingy back until he eventually got him in the 11th round. You know, for me, is if you watch his front foot, he's getting hit with crackers, but he's still no further than an inch away. You know what I mean? Right. You know, he's still within stumping ground. You know what I mean? And I always noticed that and says the big puma bit, he was not sponsored by puma. You know, the big puma bit, you can see it. He was, he was still within range. You know, even though he was getting hit with bombs, he didn't go back on the way out of the road. He was still within the range until Hegler got him. But at the same time, every time he hit Hegler, Hegler never moved back either. So I think it was yeah. he was a light middleweight, wasn't he? He was indeed. Yes, he Aye. was indeed. And he stepped up to take the fight with Hegler. And once again, Hegler's granite chin prevailed because he took some bombs. There's not many he, middleweights going to talk. Didn't he? Didn't he? He Six took so much. terrific. You took the words out of your mouth. It was unbelievable. And the ninth round was actually good as well. Amazing but no, the sixth, the sixth, the sixth round was the highlight. That was Mickey Duff thought he had something that he could yeah, take yeah. over into the eye. You know what I mean? He was the... He, they, had he, the priest, he, they had a priest in Mugabe's corner also. Right, yeah, I, really, I can't remember his surname. Fowler, such, such and such. He was trying to motivate Mugabe. 
Right, right, right. There you are. So then, Eamon uh, had one fight left in him. He sort of went off, I went off for a year. I went off for a year after that. And then, obviously, there was talk about Leonard. And coming near the end, I suppose, you know, he, he had turned around and said to himself, this is a big money fight. Uh, what was it, five million each? Something like that, yeah. It was a big money fight. It was the one that it was the one that tied up the, the life, the career, it yep. them or not, and he couldn't walk away from it. He couldn't not no. take the fight because if he didn't take the fight, he'd have been ever forever labelled then as the man that didn't. Take, you know what I mean? So he had no other choice. He, he announced his retirement after the Mugabe fight in the ring. That's and right. As you say, it was too much money, too big a uh, fight, and he and he always thought he had the better of Leonard. You know, you're going into 1987 here, obviously. Yep. I remember it so well. You know, the de the, the destiny of Caesars, they called it, and the war and all these different types of names. All these different types of credits they gave it, you know, and there was posters. I got the poster. I had the poster in my bedroom. We got it out of the KO magazine. You know, all these different things, you know what I mean? And obviously, the fight came up, and the fight went off, and, you know, and then the deci yeah. decisions were made, and yeah. history was made, you know, and... And that's the sort of fight that just, I think that fight grabbed the world even more than him and Hearns. Right. Well, huh? uh, a lot of yeah, a lot of controversy around it uh, regarding the decision, but it was Marvin Hagler himself that that uh, cried robbery. And mm -hmm. uh, yep, I suppose he was so used to winning that he wasn't used to losing. But he was a yeah, bad obviously, loser. I, I. He was a bad loser. And I loved him. He was a big, mass big fan of Marvin Hagler. Uh, oh, I, I, I. I did think Leonard beat him. He, he you know, I, that, I, 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 that's, he wasn't dignified in defeat. I, whereas he, he, may, he may have been able to walk out with his tail between his legs a wee bit more respect. If he had it, just a minute, just the man was better than him and he got me more, you know what I mean? I think, you know, that Leonard's style of fighting, you know, was able to, you know, I, I still think that they were able to, he was able to roost the crowd. You know, he was going into, he he was going into he the... He stole the fight. He stole the fight. You know, he was going into the corners, you know, in the last 30 seconds, and he was hiding right. in the corner, and then he was coming out with these five or six or these eight or nines. Yes. You know. Yep. But I still think... Side, I still think, you see, that Hume of Valley always said, there's two ways they want to fight. There's two ways they want to round. Look good at the start and look good at the end. Yeah. And I think that that was and the plan. Leonard, Leonard, a big underdog, massive underdog, getting into the fight, as I say. It he was, I. Uh, one fight in five years. And he had, he, had the, he had the retina, you mean? That was the guy putting... Yeah, well, he, you got, know. he got the retina in 82, and he retired in 82. And uh, he had the one fight in 84 against Kevin Hard. Where he was Kevin Hard. And then he came back to fight Hagler. Nobody thought he had a chance. It was a no. great performance against Kevin Hard, who was just a so-so uh, late middleweight. So nobody thought he had a chance against the, the fearsome and Hagler. But Leonard says, if you're a batting man, you'll bat Hagler. But if you're a smart man, you'll bat me. Ah. He, knew, he, he must have knew he had something up his sleeve. You know, there's no doubt about it. Because for me, at that stage, you you know, as you're saying there, I can through a retina operation and a few other situations happening and a couple of law suites and then getting beat in a comeback against the guy who really shouldn't have been in the ring with him. And then to go and take on Marvin Hagler, you know, like, that took balls. That, that took balls. Excuse the term. He's seen a lot of signs. He's seen signs in the Duran fight. He knew how to beat. He, he was saying then in eighty three. He knew how to beat Leonard. Uh, how to beat Hagler. He's seen them weaknesses or whatever in the Duran fight in eighty three, and then the Mugabe fight in eighty six. He again seen a lot of flaws in Marvin Hagler and thought now was the time to beat him. Huh? Marvin coming towards the end of a long, grueling career. Oh, yeah. Retirement in the ring after he yeah. Gabby. But just the money was too too much to turn down. Because there was actually there was actually a time before that there. I think it was actually a, a Hagler fight. No, it wasn't a Hagler fight. I think it was actually a Hearns fight. Where Hearns was fighting someone, I think it was James Kinchin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He put Kinchin out in two rounds, was it, for the NABF after that was oh, the he first won play, won a, he won a unanimous close unanimous points decision. But he was very badly hurt in the fight, Tommy Hearns. Well, who was it he put out then just before? Uh, Tommy Hearns. He put a boy out just before, Dur or just after Duran, or no, just after Hearns, or no, just after Hagler. Gold, something, something. After Hagler, he beat Barkley, Aaron Barkley. He came back and beat in 1988. I know, I know he did, I know he did, I know he did. He didn't have any quick knockouts. 
Yeah. Well, who, who, who was the boy? Richard Allen, we're talking about. Hearns. Oh, Fred, you're talking about James Shuler. Not the James, James Shuler is the very man. James oh, Shuler is the very man. That's when Hagler fought McGabe. Aye. A few weeks later, Shuler died in a motorcycle crash. No, you are. I wasn't aware of that. You don't yeah, wasn't aware and, of that. And Hearns, the fourth for the NABC title, North America. That's right. Yes, that's right. And, that's what, and, that's and what Hearns, got Hearns back on the road again. Well, he put the belt in the uh, Shuler's coffin. He was buried with that belt. Amazing. Yes, that was a ferocious knockout. That was a ferocious Oh, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? Just, right about, just straight down, straight down. Straight Aye, down. I mean it. Aye. Mugabe, uh, Aye. Hagler card. There you are, I wasn't aware of that. Like, they, uh, imagine trying to sell... You didn't have to go and sell tickets. You didn't have to sell tickets, you know. Because them tickets just sold themselves. Imagine just Hagler and... Your, just a pity you know, we never got the rematch between Leonard and Hagler. And listen, ah, oh, that's true too. You know, but you know, if you look, if you look at the likes of, uh, you know, like you could have went Hagler, Duran, Hearns, Leonard. You know, like, right. you want know, it didn't get any better than that. I would pick, in order of my preference, the greatest out of the four of them would be Roberto Duran, then Sugar Ray Leonard, then Marvin Hagler, then Tommy Hearns. But there's very little to separate the four. Why would, you, why would you say that then whenever he was defeated by the other three? Because Roberto Drum's only a lightweight. That's only a lightweight he, coming up. Aye, aye. Lightweight. He was a fat welterweight and an even fatter middleweight. But he was only a natural lightweight. He was a small guy. And mainly, he, he was, was the only one of the... the and he was the only one of the two that beat Leonard. And he beat Leonard well. Oh, yes. In the first fight, yes. Oh, he did. Aye, it's good at Leonard. Well, Hearns drew with Leonard and most people think. Even Leonard himself. Thought that Hearn should have got the decision. Aye, so did aye. Did that was one of the red and white shorts that come back. Aye, that's correct. Yes, that's but I don't think they were. I don't think they were as explosive as what they were back in eighty one. You know, or eighty two or eighty three. You know, if, if Hearns and uh, Leonard had a fought automatically back again after eighty one, you might have got even more. Because I thought that was the greatest fight I ever seen. Eighty one. Well, uh, Sherman, it was a great. The brawl in Montreal. Boxing. Oh, you mean I meant them four in the eighties. You had Aaron Pryor, you had Alexis Arguello, you had Larry yeah. Holmes, you yeah. had uh, Michael Spinks. I mean, it was a great, a great time for, for me and for you. But boxing isn't the same now as it was then. Even it's not the same now because, you know, that there's so many belts, there's so much there's so much control, you know, uh, controversy as far as, you know, like, the, 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 I, I'm a firm believer of, do you see if at, at this moment in time, because there's too much of this and too much of that, I'm a firm believer, states. I'm a firm believer, states that. Do you see if the see if the managers and the promoters can't sort out Tyson Fury to fight Anthony Joshua? They should be banned from doing business for twelve months. The title should be removed, and two other people should be fighting for it. Because it used to be, whenever you be at the number one, whoever was number two was next. There was none of this going up in number 19 and then 14 and then 12 and 6 and 5 and 3 and 2. You fought whoever was there. Like, Larry Holmes won the world title. Had to fight Ken Norton. Ernie Shavers. First, second, third, fourth. There was none of this, you know, like, all this hand-picking and all, and all this money making, you know what I mean? Like, Anthony Joshua has made that much money, he probably never know what to do with it. Well, he probably will. He's got business minded. But it's a business. It's not a ruthless... It's not a ruthless champion. It's not a ruthless... He wouldn't be in my top 50. Right. Pinkman Thomas. Pinkman Thomas would have beaten right. Tim Weatherspoon would have beaten Tony, Tony oh, Thomas would have beaten Great fighters, yeah. You know, Tony... Tony, Tony great Tom fighter. Ah, Tim Weatherspoon was brilliant. All great fighters, yeah. No. You know, yeah. Tim Weatherspoon would have beaten any of these boys nowadays. You know, and that's including Tyson Fury. You know, Tyson Fury's a good fighter. But you see if you threw Tyson Fury in, you know, with a hungry George Foreman at 25 years age, Foreman would have killed him. Foreman could have asked him in charge with murder. In a broke his ribs. Well, you know, <laughs> I knew somebody, somebody was in my way there and said, You better say this to help me keep me in a good mood. <laughs> but but hey, see what you say. Yep. I'm going to help. See what you say regarding Sugar Ray Leonard and Aaron Pryor. Yeah. I would make the parallel of Barry McGuigan and Azuma Nelson. People say, Why did Barry McGuigan avoid Azuma Nelson? The, 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 the answer is, it didn't make good business. Barry McGuigan Why not? was getting the same money to fight Joe Bloggs. Why would he take a risk and fight Azuma Nelson? And the but same then where did, Sugar Ray Leonard. 
But then where, where, where does the fascination of the credit of calling yourself a champion come in, Eamon? That's yeah, actually, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, because we, we, can, we, can go off, we can go off the conversation here and then go back to it, because that's actually quite brilliant. Because if there's anybody who would know what they were talking about here in that subject, it's you. And I've always had that out with a couple of people. You know, like, there's a guy back home here called uh, Sean Johnson. Sean was a tremendous yeah, amateur boxer. Yeah, well, Sean never, Sean never materialised into anything that he could have materialised into. You know, right. Sean had that many trophies he could have started a bloody ten yard. You know what I mean? But he never material, he never really matured into anything because he gave it up with sixteen or seventeen. You know what I mean? You know, could have went a lot further with dedication. You know, but the thing is, Sean always says to me, he says, you know, like Barry McGuigan was good, but he never took on the best. He never took on Azuma Nelson, or he never took on Jeff Fennick. Well, Jeff Fanny come up. I was after McGuigan. That you know. That, Do you think was that was that too far? Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, yeah, just right. a wee bit too far. But you know, would have thought of Zuma Nelson if it had made sense. It didn't make financially. It didn't make sense. McGuigan was getting the same money to fight Joe Bloggs. He didn't need to fight Zuma Nelson. Listen, no boxer is a scarier than another boxer. That's well, then why did they not? Fight? That's that's my argument there. As you know, my business, argument only. Business. It's business. It didn't make business sense. You know, Why take I the think risk if you're getting the same money to fight, you know, somebody who's not quite as good. Aye, uh, but then we're going back at the same argument as as the heavyweights not fighting the number one or the number two. You know, surely that that should be. Do you not think? You know, do you not think a unification and then well, one champion and they should be forced into fighting the, the, the number one. That's what I was trying to say there. Do you know? Do you not think that obviously Barry McGregor being the WBA at the time, and then your wee man being the WBC, wee Nelson. You know, do you not think that they should have had a fought together to get the one champion? I think that's what they should do, old, because yeah, that creates. Azuma Nelson was Azuma Nelson was champion before McGuigan. Azuma Nelson yes. beat Wilfredo Gomez. He did. In 1984. McGuigan beat Pedro's in 1985. So there you are. Why should them two have not been fighting in 1986? Then you know what I mean. You know, or 85, or you know, these are questions, Eamon, that we'll never yeah, ever answer. Listen, listen McGuigan beat Juan Laporte. Won the early yeah. round, outclassed Outstanding him. fight. A couple of years, a couple of years after that, won the poor team near knocked Azuma Nelson out in Australia. Had him uh, out in his feet twice. Gone. Uh, Azuma Nelson won a very close decision. But you know, if you make the comparison there, uh, I won the poor team easy. I. Uh, so we just don't know. I, I, you know, most people think Azuma Nelson would have beat him, but it just didn't make good business sense. But well, it wasn't where he was a scared of him. That's not. No, 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 no. I, I think personally, he probably would have beat McGregor. I think his wee head would have been too strong. I think he had too much granite there. You know, a wee granite head. You know, but but then hey, if McGregor can get a tore into him too, you know what I mean? You know, so yes. these are questions. He, he, oh, you know, like can you imagine the likes? The of, public was robbed. The public was robbed. That's where I'm coming from. The public was robbed of all these great fights in the past because there's one thing what we could do. We could sit in this bit of paper here all night and we could write down fights that never happened and say, flip sake, imagine listen, that. Flip listen, sake, imagine Leonard that. Never, Leonard never ducked anybody. Leonard won the title against a great operator in Wilfredo Benitez. He defended Aye. against Roberto Duran. Uh, he lost his title, then he reclaimed it against Roberto Duran. And then he fought the fearsome Tommy Hearns. Sugar Ray Leonard took on the best boxers there was. You know, the, 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 uh, as I say, the Aaron Pryor thing, Aaron Pryor was a late well, It didn't make great money. You know, didn't make business. So Leonard went for the, for the money, for the dough. Aye. Well, you know, and, uh, that's all understandable, isn't it? You know, you're risking your life. You pay your money. You've you got your choice. Uh, Aaron Pryor, the Hawk, brilliant wee fighter. Oh, I loved him. I loved him. Alexis Arguello. Oh, uh, literally uh, never. I, m I met the guy that he took the title of, Antonio Kid Pamela Cervantes. I met mm -hmm. him in... Uh, I mean, I mean you saying that one time. I mean you saying that. I mean you saying that one time. He was a down and out. He was tapping us for money. God bless him. A legend, an absolute legend. And Antonio Kid Cervantes claims that Duran avoided him. He he, he bypassed late welterweight and he went from lightweight up to welterweight to fight Sugar Ray Leonard. And Antonio Kid Pamela Cervantes says that Duran avoided him. But that's nonsense too. Duran avoided. You know, him. but who, who, what would you have done? Would you have, would you have went for him or go to Leonard? Set a million dollars yeah, setting. He was getting ten times more money. Ah, Leonard. you know what I mean? You know, ah, yeah, you know. And that's what I'm saying you know. about Aaron Pryor and Ray Leonard and Azuma Nelson and Barry McGuigan. It's business. No boxers are scared of another boxer. No. But it all boils down to the rubies. Sure, look at all them journey, man. They box all world champions. Uh, and they, box. they don't no. duck anybody. There was actually even just before Yeah, can I, have, can I give a big shout out to my mates who are all sitting watching this, my work mates? Oh, yeah. Mark Aye, Cole, of course. Harry Larkin and Sam McBurney. 
great guys, far set. We're all frontline workers, delivering to the needy and the vulnerable. Absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, Eamon. And that for me makes you a chuckle. Give me a fiver each to give them a mansion. Not That's what, well, listen. Well, Eamon, I'm, I, I'm just deduct, I'm deducting of £2.50 of each one of them. Well, they have a couple of pictures here of Hegler whenever he was younger. Look at that. There, look, he's starting her. Huh? He's got her there. He's got her. Oh, That's him starting That was him starting to sprout out in his younger day, hey, you know. This is him here, not just with, with the titles and whatnot, you know, and, and his happy days. Look at that. Uh -huh. Huh? Yeah. Look at that there. Should that there be worth framing, wouldn't it? I would indeed. I would indeed. And that's it. I'm so sorry I never got a photo. When I met him in 1981. Oh, I mean, imagine. Imagine, imagine, imagine you got it signed, even. I know. Imagine, imagine you'd have got it signed. Well, Eamon, listen. You, you must get John Montague on and get John Montague. I have facilitated it. Oh. And he well, something going. I, I'm home. I'm home. I'm home in three weeks' time, and we'll maybe get hopefully when things relax a bit because they're starting to relax now. I think after after the middle of April here, we'll maybe be able to get a coffee up in Belfast. Me and you and Eamon at uh, Locker, and, and we'll come up meet for a coffee and stuff. You know what I mean? We'll get a good chat going and better. You Absolutely. know what I mean? Obviously, yeah, of course. To yeah, and the, so do we. And the thing is, there's just one last thing I want to ask you here. There's a kid. I call my kid because I'm nearly 50 now, you know what I mean? I'm 49. I can do that. Hey, get all, hey. I can, call, I can call you a kid. You know, there's a kid There's a kid in Belfast, and for me, he's the most exciting fighter coming out of Belfast in years. There's boys talk about all these other guys wanting the Olympics, not done all these other things. They haven't materialised. The only one that's materialised is we call him. Now, he was going to get well pampered because he'd done so well in his amateur career. The rest of them, are trying to get there. Yeah. You've uh, Crocker, you've uh, what do we call it there? We be D in them boys. These guys is all good, but this guy I'm going to mention to you tonight. He was to fight tonight on AFL TV. I don't know whether you'll be watching it or not. It's on free on YouTube. There's a couple of Irish fighters in it. We D watches a Patrick couple. Patrick Highland. Patrick Highland. Well, it was this guy here. Do you know him? Yeah, he's some fighter. He's a great fighter. A great punk. That's Potty McCrory. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Potty the Hammer McCrory. I interviewed yeah. Potty about 12 weeks ago. I never met a nicer, easier talking guy in all my life. I never met a more calmer, relaxed, uh, respectful guy in all my life. His attitude stinks. And I mean stinks with goodness. Do you see if you says to him, Eamon Locker says to me one time about a young fighter in Balamini, he says, if I asked him to meet me and talk with Slimish tomorrow morning at four o'clock, he says he'd be there at half three waiting on me. This guy has it. He's this guy... talent. Talent. He's and the I best fighter. I'm, I'm telling you now. I'm telling you now, Macaulay. He is the best fighter to <laughs> love <laughs> you. He is the best fighter I have seen. He's the well, he's the best up and coming fighter. No, no, it's got to make it could be it sometime. Of course, he's only human. He was to fight the night. He was to fight the night on TV and he, he injured his knee during the week. I know he did. I know he did. But listen, did. you had disappointment plenty of time in your fighting career. What would you say to a guy like that there? What would you say to you? you? There's many a day you missed away, and there's many a time your other fighter didn't turn up, and you had to meet. What would you say to Leslie? Say to him. Well, look at look at you know Marvin Hagler. You you know you just you know if you're going to be great, if you're a truly great fighter, you'll get over it. I didn't. So, but you know if you're a truly great, we all have our setbacks. Boxing, you'll have loads of setbacks. You got to be prepared for that. You'll have loads of setbacks in professional boxing. And I wasn't good enough to get over them. So that's what makes a world champion. That's what makes a great fighter. They've had loads of setbacks. They've overcame them. And he's a great what, what would player. you say? What would you say to young Potty? He's, he's, he's watching here tonight. What would you say to young Potty, uh, uh, the Hammer, McCrory? Who, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, say, I'm just letting that everybody that. know. I'm just letting everybody know. And everybody in, on the island of Ireland, excuse me. Letting everybody that's Irish know this guy is worth supporting. He yeah. is a great guy. His attitude is 110%. He's totally on the ball. He's dedicated. He's given his life. He's got a couple of beautiful kids, a nice wife, runs a good family, runs his own wee business, just luckily trying to get something like And Eamon, I love him because I just think he's got, he's got everything that's taken yeah, and that like, you need. We're super excited with Padre McCrory. I think he's... he's uh, I was shocked that the, uh, the lad there... Uh, what do you call him? The young lad there, the McComb, got beat. Yeah. I would say Paddy McCrory is the best prospect now in Ireland. Well, that's what I'm saying to you. That's what I'm saying to you. That's what I think, and that's why I've brought him here. But he was to fight. 
It was the fight tonight live on TV on AFL TV, which I'm going to be watching later on, and hopefully you'll maybe tune in yourself. D Walsh has got a couple of fighters on it, and I love D. D. He's a gentleman. But the thing is, he hurt his knee, and he's hurt, his heart broken, he's disappointed. And what just before we finish, what would you say to him? Not about all these, what would you say? Just to concentrate, get the head down, forget about it, keep it going, get the diet, get the ice on the knee, and keep playing on. Absolutely, because, you know, he's got a lot of fans out there. He's got a big fan base. We're all super excited about him. Uh, you know, j j just keep going. I have a lot of regrets. You know, I wasn't able to keep going. I had about 10 opponents pulled out of me. Many of the times I've travelled over to London to box and the opponent pulled out at the last minute. It's tough when it, you have to keep going, keep going, overcome that, be bigger than that. And that's what makes champions. And that's why I wasn't good enough, because I couldn't overcome that. You know, if you want to be a champion... You, you, you know, you gotta you got to overcome silly things like that. He'll get, over, he'll get back. And he is really, really a precocious talent. Really a super prospect. Mm -hmm. He's a good-looking kid. He can bang. He can box. He had a good yeah. amateur pedigree. He's, he ticks all the boxes. And he's, he's going to go right to the top. And Eamon Lockhart says to me, the main thing is he's disciplined. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's good. Then. That's all good. And he's got that uh, family... Unit there too. Yeah, yeah. Back down to earth. Aye. So, well, let's see. Let's see how he comes back. Let's see if he's good enough. Let's this is it, Eamon. Even. This is it. But we believe in him. We believe in him. But we believe in him, but. But we believe yeah. in him. And the same for McComb. Let's yes. see him come back. Yes, let's see how good you are, lads. That's what happens. Even mountains can fall. It's building yes. the mountain back. There's plenty of cement for sale. Get the cement, get the ladder out, and start building a brick wall again. And then get... On it, you know what I mean? Because hopefully, whenever we're I'm, I'm home and whenever the fight night's on, I'll be able to bring the cameras up. Eamon, and me and you can do the, you know, we'll do the Weinstein and the, the, the what do we call it? The uh, not Weinstein, what do you call them? Uh, Einstein, of the, I have. Uh, we'll do that. Stop, stop while you're behind, you start a body and then you feel it. <laughs> what is it you call them? The uh, I'll be the uh, Larry Merchant and you can be the other guy, and we'll get a good banter going and we'll let people know that this is what's happening and people will get interested, you know what I mean? And local boxers want to get reliving again. Eamon, I just want to say before I go here, because we're, we're running out of time, basically. We've only so much time on air. I just want to say thanks very much again for giving me your time. Thanks very much for giving me your space. Thanks very much for everything you do for local pops and as far as, uh, you know, all the bits and bobs. And keep doing your good work daily and keep helping other people, Eamon. And uh, I can only say that, obviously, as Muhammad Ali says, it's the rent that you'll pay for whenever you get to heaven. It's plain and simple as that. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much, Sherman. I really, really love talking to you. And I look forward to getting together. And Eamon, Eamon, Hedler, there's no way Hedler. <laughs> I was going to go just before we go. Leonard won easy. Leonard won easy. Okay, Eamon, all the best. God bless my friend. All Thanks the best and God bless my friend. Thank you very much, gentlemen. God bless your soul.